but the particular argument of natural theology, to review it for you, is that not only God's existence, but also his benevolence, his omniscience, and his intelligence can be illustrated from the nature of the works of the creation, in particular from two aspects of natural history, namely the good design of organisms and the harmony of ecosystems. The good design of organisms and the harmony of ecosystems must mean that a benevolent God, a benevolent all-knowing and omniscient God, created them. You, know, you read Paley's famous metaphor of the watch. If I'm walking across a heath and I kick my foot against a stone and I look at it, I won't know who made the stone because it's disordered and I can't make an inference about the nature of the maker or the origin of this thing. But if I kick my foot against a watch and I pick it up and look at it and understand how it works, I know there has to be a watchmaker. Organisms are better designed than watches, so there has to be a benevolent creating God. That's the so-called argument from design. Now, here's the point of this long story. I hope you'll pardon me for spitting it out because it is, it is the most central radicalism of Darwin. The most radical feature of the theory of natural selection is the way in which, as its central postulate, it undermines in the most radical possible way the argument from design. That's, in a sense, what it's constructed to do. Now, I don't know that Darwin did this explicitly on purpose to confute Fitzroy, but I have this view. It's the fly on the wall fantasy again. There's Darwin. He's beginning to doubt religious views, beginning to get some ideas about evolution, eating with Fitzroy every day, frustrated as hell about slavery and other issues and things he can't confute him on, and every day Fitzroy is at him. Darwin, did you see that lizard? Did you see how beautifully adapted it was? Doesn't that prove the existence of an all-knowing God who made it just that way because it's so beautifully adapted? Day after day for five years, the argument from design, the argument from design, unable to confute, undoubtedly get... Wouldn't that drive you to, to think about constructing an opposite theory? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you were Darwin, if you were someone of that brilliance, you know, there's a famous story about Fitzroy True, that he appeared in his demented state late in life at the famous Oxford meeting where Huxley debated Wilberforce, or didn't. That story is also often mistold. Uh, carrying a Bible above his head, saying, the book, the book, and cursing himself for having been an unwitting agent of Darwin's apostasy. Now, I think that all that Fitzroy was thinking is that he'd been an unwitting agent in the sense he brought Darwin to all these places where he got these terrible ideas. But you see, I think Fitzroy was right in a deeper way that he never understood. I think he was the unwitting agent in a much more direct way by hammering Darwin day after day with argument from design, argument from design. That's the fundamental observation of natural history that is the most central postulate about the nature of the natural world out there. Because let's look at it in the abstract. When I, when I tell you, suppose, let's just suppose I'm right, that Darwin in some psychologically explicit or implicit sense is trying to refute the argument from design. How do you go about it? Well, I can imagine two ways. One thing you might do, and it would be pretty radical, but it's not what Darwin did, and it's not the most radical argument. It'd be pretty radical. You could say, hey, there's a lot of good design in nature, but you know there's a lot of very bad design in nature also. Some things are badly designed, some things are horribly cruel by human standards, like the ichneumonid wasp that paralyzes the caterpillar, lays the eggs inside the living tissue of the caterpillar. When they hatch, they eat the caterpillar from inside, still alive though paralyzed, saving the heart and nervous system for last so the caterpillar doesn't rot. Not very nice by human standards. <laughs> you, might, you might infer from that that if you wish to say that God's nature and attributes and existence can all be inferred from the argument from design, then maybe if nature is so cruel and so messy, maybe that's not the kind of God you want. Maybe you ought to be making that argument. And that would be a pretty radical argument, but that's not the one Darwin made. In fact, Darwin accepted the postulate. He said, yes, there's some cruelty and some messiness, but for the most part, organisms are well-designed and ecosystems are harmonious. And now we come to the more radical argument, the one that Darwin did take as the central postulate of the theory of natural selection. And that is, you say, oh, Paley, you're absolutely right. Your observations are correct. Organisms are well-designed and ecosystems are harmonious. But guess what? 
That doesn't illustrate the existence and benevolence of an explicitly creating deity. In fact, just the opposite. Although those are true observations, they arise instead as side consequences. There is no principle explicitly producing them at all. They arise as side consequences, in fact, and here's the ultimate, almost cruel irony with respect to Paley, they arise as side consequences of the only thing that's really happening in nature, a thing which if you wished to imbue it with moral meaning, which you should not, that's the point I'll get back to at the end, would seem to make a mockery of the whole argument for design. Maybe the only thing that's really happening in nature is that organisms are striving for personal reproductive success. That's all. They are out for themselves. All, I mean, they're not doing it in any conscious sense, but that's all natural selection is about. The organisms that are more successful in reproduction pass, in modern parlance, more of their genes into future generations. That's all there is. There is no principle of the good of the species. There's no principle of excellence of design explicitly so made. There's no principle of the harmony of ecosystems. These all arise as side consequences of the only thing that's really happening out there in nature, which is of opposite import to what we thought Paley's God was teaching us. And the only thing that's really happening out there is organisms are struggling for individual reproductive success for themselves, and that is absolutely all. Now that's really a radical argument, and that is Darwin's argument, and that's something we haven't wanted to make peace with, that the natural selection is so rigidly naturalistic, so purposeless, it's only about organisms struggling for themselves for personal reproductive success, it leads only to local adaptation, not to any form of predictable progress, and that's all there is to it. Um, yes, where did, where did Darwin get this? Where does it come from? And to some of you, I'm sure you realize that it sounds very much like uh, another theory you know about, and this is an interesting point, that is where Darwin's got it. It's very close to Adam Smith's economics, and we now know that in 1838, when Darwin developed the principle of natural selection, that's what he was doing for the few weeks before he got this great insight after reading Malthus, that is, he was studying the work of the Scottish economists through the work of Douglas Stewart on the life of Adam Smith. That is Adam Smith's argument transferred to nature. That's the beauty of it. I mean, think about it. You, we want a well-ordered economy. Now, you might think that the best way to get a well-ordered economy that will turn the greatest good to the greatest number is to get all the smart folks who know a lot about economics, give them power, sit them around a table, and let them figure out how to do it, and then pass laws explicitly for that arrangement. Now, that's the equivalent of Paley's God. If you want good organization and harmony, just let an all-knowing God make it explicitly. You know, let the economists who know it best just make the laws. But Adam Smith's argument is wonderfully paradoxical. He says, no, that may seem right, but in fact you want to do something that looks like the opposite. What you want to do is let individuals struggle for personal profit, and you don't trammel them in any way. That's laissez-faire. You just let them be. You let them struggle for personal profit, and that's all. There is no higher principle. If you do that without any trammels, then the ones who do it well will drive out the others. The ones who do it well will balance each other, and you end up indirectly with the well-functioning economy by letting people struggle for personal profit. And then Smith introduces that wonderful metaphor, one of the great lines in the English language, that you get that order and harmony, he says, through the action of an invisible hand. That there is no directing hand of Haley's God. It's the invisible hand. The only thing that's happening is you're letting individuals struggle for personal profit, and out of that indirectly comes the maximally ordered economy. Darwin's argument is the same transferred to nature. Truly, you can't take it with you, so personal profit is not the natural analog, but reproductive success is. So in nature, all you have are organisms struggling for individual reproductive success. That is, for their own benefits and passing more of their genetic material onto future generations. And that is all. That is all Darwinism is about. And it seems cruel, and it seems heartless, and it seems counter to our hopes, and we haven't liked it. And that there endeth the first riddle.